humans, how's it going? Susan Ruth here. Thanks for listening to another episode of Hey Human Podcast. This is episode 239. And a little while ago, I had a conversation with Dr. Stephen Grenade. He's a physicist, a research scientist in lasers and robotics, and writer of both interactive and regular fiction. He's hosted a science YouTube show for NASA called No Small Steps, and he has his own shows on YouTube as well, Ever Wonder Why and Let's Play Interactive. He specializes in sensors for robotic vehicles. Very cool. Dr. Grenade has worked on sensors that can read your fingerprints from 10 feet away, systems that uh, allow for unpiloted helicopters, which is super cool, army unmanned aerial vehicles, and a video-based sensor that helped guide the space shuttle to the Hubble Space Telescope. Well, that's a lot, I think. Really fun conversation, really nice guy. Uh, Very much enjoyed uh, speaking with him. And another shout out to Trevor Valley, who connected me to Stephen. And you know I love me some science. Uh, Other usual stuff, social media, Hey Human Podcast is on Facebook and Instagram. You can find my personal social media at Susan Ruthism on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Feel free to email me, Susan, at heyhumanpodcast.com. Rate and review Hey Human on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Check out merch, Hey Human Podcast merch on the heyhumanpodcast.com website. You'll also find a links page, and I try to put interesting things up there, books, articles, stuff we talk about, uh, uh, so that you can find it all in one place easily. Definitely check that stuff out. If you're into music, check out my albums on iTunes under Susan Ruth. I'm also on Spotify. If you want to know more about me, go to SusanRuth.com, and you can always sign up for the mailing list there. Thanks so much for listening, everybody. Take care, be kind, and uh, here we go. Dr. Stephen Grenade, welcome to Hey Human. Thank you. I'm really pleased to be here. Firstly, what a cool name. <laughs> it's, um, I didn't pick it myself. It was given to me. Um, but yes, it, it, it's very clearly French. Um, and in case you were clearly wondering what side of the French Revolution my family was on. As the firstborn of my generation, I was supposed to have been a Napoleon. Okay. (laughs) Uh, I I think my parents decided rightfully that Napoleon Grenade was too much of a a name for me to carry around. I mean, talk about some heavy loads to, you know. Yeah, very much. Although it's a great name for an actor or you're an author, so it's also a great name for an author. But Stephen works too. I do. <laughs> All right, so let's get to the descriptor. You are, um, you have a do- you have a doctorate. It's in physics, but you also mm-hmm. have a theater degree. Yeah, in undergraduate, I was kind of a member of the major of the month club. Uh, but as my chemistry professor said, you're supposed to drop the old ones. So I ended up with one degree in physics and chemistry and another degree in theater. Okay, that's I think a well-rounded human. I liked it a lot. Um, I have a lot of interests. I have a lot of things that I do, a lot of hobbies, a lot of things I like to create. Um, So college let me kind of try all of those things. Absolutely. And you are a research scientist. That's your the thing in quotes. But uh, your thing is lasers and robotics. Yes. Yes. So if you had been named Napoleon Grenade and you built a robot that could shoot lasers, you would be unstoppable. It does sound like I'm, I'm auditioning to be a supervillain. I know, it's so fantastic. <laughs> Someone should do a graphic novel on you. Yeah, I, I feel like there should be science graphic novels. I think about, uh, there was the Matt Fraction, Five Fists of Science, which has Nikola Tesla and I think Mark Twain in it. Yeah, I know about that one. Did they did they turn that into a movie? I don't know. I, it feels like they did, but I can't actually remember that now. So I feel like they did I, also, but I might be making that up in my head out of a desire for it to be true. Right. <laughs> I do think that's, that's bias right there in a nutshell. Right. It's true because I want it to be true. Um, I was thinking about different ways to start this conversation. And I think 
the first thing that caught my eye about when reading about you was uh, that you you designed a robotic system that reads fingerprints from 10 feet away. Yes. Firstly, what is, why? And secondly, <laughs> how? Um, so it was a camera-based way of, of reading fingerprints, and the idea was to create something that was touchless. Um, this was, I guess, about 10 years or so ago. Uh, it, a lot more relevant now when you see people, like, putting their finger on the little fingerprint readers and like it doesn't work so they lick their finger and try again and like oh, I just no, I lick the no, machine that. that's what I do just lick that machine straight yeah, up yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so tasty <laughs> um but if there were ways of of doing that um very quickly and and that was really what we were trying to do was come up with a a more hygienic non-contact way um and we had one one version that it would work from about 10 feet away you would hold up your hands and hold still and it would take a little camera and zoom in on each finger to to read your fingerprints so it's not like it was stealth stealing people's fingerprints like you had to cooperate with it yeah um, very intriguing and then eventually turned into this little kiosk that you would walk through and wave your hand through it for it to get your fingerprints i imagine it's somewhere along the lines of the thing that reads your eyeball right well and <clears throat> excuse me and there are um we all have allergies right now. I'm doing that too. <laughs> There's smoke and yeah. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> no, it's all right. Yeah, I get to play the fun game of uh, allergies or COVID. That's always fun. Yeah. Um, but there are places like in um, amusement parks, like uh, Disney World, would very much like you to buy a ticket and only you use it instead of like hand it to somebody else, so they want to tie it to your fingerprints but you also if you think about the lines at disney world don't want to have this huge line where it takes you 30 seconds to get someone's fingerprints right so being able to wave your hand through um and do it quickly is of interest uh but it was one of those things that um we got it working and we just could not get the market there for it and i was like oh yeah business is hard yeah for sure it is an intriguing it's intriguing uh, you may not know the answer to this, but the question popped in my head. Do we... We have toe prints, right? Do we have toe prints? Same as fingerprints? That's a good question. I I've never even assume so, but I've never actually thought about right, that. I'm looking right now at my toe. I want to say have yes. To, have to check I wonder if well. our toes match our fingers, even though they're uniquely ours. That's an interesting oh, idea. Oh, you mean like, like they're matched? Yeah, like thumb, big toe... You know, it seems seems like that would be too neatly lined up. To I be know, true. but I love that idea. <laughs> the OCD in me really likes it. <laughs> yeah. How were you a kid that that took things apart and put them back together, or were you more in the theater stuff back then? Um, I actually didn't do a whole lot of theater until I got to college. Um, it was one of those cases where I I got to college and there was an ad up looking for people to try out for one act plays. And so, you know, I'm a, a new freshman. I'm like, okay, sure. I'll give that a try. And I got cast. I was like, Oh, I like this. This is fun. Um, but as a kid, it was much more tinkering with objects. Um, I, at one point I decided to try science on the bathroom closet. So I would pull out chemicals and see which ones would burn. Um, so there's a, a whole lot of fire and a lot of, of, trying things out like that and looking back i'm like i'm surprised my parents were saying sure go ahead and do that that'll be fine i lit my room on fire twice and they had to take the carpet out of when i got in trouble for that because i was doing experiments they had to take <laughs> the carpet out because i started doing them in the closet and some of them went awry and i ended up just destroying the carpet oh no <laughs> but i sure had fun i learned a lot <laughs> right oh uh, yeah there was one point for uh, like a high school science fair um where i got interested in magnetism and there's this thing where if you put uh, a wire on top of a bar magnet and run a current through it and that wire can turn then it'll it'll spin around uh because it it creates a magnetic field that interacts with the magnetic field of the bar magnet but the thing is if you're going to do that the wire has to be able to move freely and turn so I'm like, okay, so what I need to do to complete the circuit is just put the whole thing in a bowl of mercury and power oh. it with a car battery. Oh. 
and again, looking back on it, I'm like, I cannot believe I did that. That's bonkers. It is bonkers. I think about. I remember. Uh, I think it was my big brother that told me about Mercury. He said it does really cool stuff. I was like, oh, he's like, don't tell dad. He broke a thermometer, and and you know the stuff was rolling around on the floor. And I was like, oh, that's really right. cool. You, you want to? He's like, don't pick it up. <laughs> Right. Luckily, since I was working with a car battery, I was doing this on our back porch, so the mercury fumes could dissipate a little more. Yeah. Did you get fun toys like uh, microscopes and things like that when you were a kid? Yeah, I had had the microscope, um, and that was fun until I realized I sort of ran out of the slides that had come in yeah. the kit, and then I'm like, oh, I've got to make slides myself. I'm like, oh, that sounds like work. Oh, I used to go to the pond and stuff and get the goo and make my brother spit on thing, you know, all that stuff. It was fun. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I love yeah, yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, you, so the robotics arm of it, no, <laughs> no pun intended. <laughs> uh, you have stuff that's out there in the space place? I do. Um, so the sort of common thread through a lot of my work has been cameras and imaging because uh, – what I was doing work in graduate school, we were using lasers to cool and trap atoms. And the way that we would take the temperature, because we were trying to get these down uh, so cold that they would become this one big quantum system. If you've ever heard of Bose-Einstein condensates, we were doing something like that. And so the way that we would take the temperature of these atoms is you turn off everything and then let the, the gas cloud of atoms expand. And the colder it is, the more slowly it expands. So you could put a camera on one side and then sort of take a flashbulb picture of it. Uh, and so you do that multiple times to see how much the, the cloud of atoms are expanding. And so I had to work a lot with, with cameras and computers and image analysis. And um, so that's sort of where my career ended up going. And then it ended up being combined with the robotics side you know, how do you put something together that can pull in images of some kind and make smart decisions about it? Um, so we were doing um, space work where you would take a camera and have known spots on a satellite and you knew how far apart they were. And so then you could look at the image and say, well, given that the, the spots are in this given configuration that we see, I can calculate that the satellite is this many meters away and it's, you know, 10 degrees on one axis and 12 on another, which is the kind of information that you need if you're going to dock with it. And um, in the mid 2000s, they wanted to repair Hubble because, you know, instruments die, uh, the coolant that they're using runs out. Uh, and so there have been four servicing missions. But um, this was right after the, the shuttle accident. And they were worried because one of the things that they said is, all right, if you know, we take a shuttle up and the, the astronauts are there, we're going to look on the underside to make sure all of the heat tiles are okay. And if they're not, they can shelter up at the ISS and we can get another um, shuttle up there. But the Hubble is in a completely different orbit than the space station. So they just have to hang out on that shuttle and wait for another shuttle to come and then they do the first ever shuttle to shuttle crossing and like oh this is bad we don't want to have to do this so they wanted to um make it easier to work on hubble using robots for the next servicing mission that might happen so we ended up making these um these really bright reflectors so that you could shine either a laser beam or bright light at them and they'd reflect light back and you'd get bright spots and you could put that on known positions on the hubble to make the kinds of measurements that I was talking about. So we were responsible for putting those, what they're called corner cube retro reflectors together, um, testing them out, making sure they worked optically, had all the right characteristics, and then were packaged so that they could stand up to the rigors of space. Because space isn't really kind to Not to anything. a human body, especially. Not to a human body, not to metal. Um, you know. As it goes in and out of the sun, it gets hot, and then it cools down, and it gets hot, and then it cools down. Yeah, which is what um, happened to the shuttle. Of course, the, the O-rings got cold right. and broke. Yeah. Yes. Um, so, yeah, it was just kind of neat. I always wanted to be an astronaut, uh, but my eyes are horrible. I'm super nearsighted, and so I never could qualify um, and, like, I can't even get LASIK to correct it. So I was like, well, 
I am not going to space. But it was really neat that eventually, all those years later, I got to to put something together and actually hold uh, instruments that then got carried up into space and that are still up there. So that was a, you know, a, a nice second place prize. That's absolutely. It's still amazing. Uh, do you control then? Are the robotics controlled in the way we would control a drone or is it algorithm based where it just knows what to do when it gets there or is there a human component on the opposite side? Um, a lot of the stuff that I have worked on has been, um, it, it was going to be just a, a pure algorithm that was going to run it. Um, so you'd have, you know, your little control loops, getting the data and feeding back and making decisions based on that. Um, that's all the stuff that I end up not working on because it's very complex and I haven't done it. I'm generally on the, what do we see and what measurements can we make with a camera? So that's most of what I do. That's awesome. Do you, are your kids into science? Yeah, yeah. They're they're into both science and art, which is Good uh, combo. a nice mix. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think it helps that um, my partner Misty is uh, an artist. Like she does uh, fine art, has done graphic design, and so they see her working on her art, and they see me doing science and doing some writing. And so that lets them see, oh, there are a bunch of different things that you can do. Yeah, and you can combine them to create interesting things. I think yes, about absolutely. the idea of uh, space travel, and I wonder if at some point we won't send, uh, I mean, an AI type situation out because because of the problem of sending people through space but then yeah. when we talk about sending people through space being a problem of course people say well that's how we know the moon landing isn't real and i said no <laughs> <You know? laughs> that, that's not how that that works but <laughs> right yeah i always and i know they've got answers for this but again as someone who works with lasers and cameras and stuff we left a giant reflector patch on the moon like the distance to the moon is one of the most well-known well-measured things that we've got like we've been measuring the distance from the earth to the moon since the the 60s since they put those reflectors up there I'm like you could actually shine your own laser at it and see the light bounce back like we put stuff up there. It's up there. Yeah, yeah. The space junk floating around. We, you know, I mean, humans are litter bugs, and obviously right. space is no different, unfortunately. I, I went to the map once and looked at all the things floating around out there, and our mutual friend Trevor was just posting about a possible collision of the junk in space. Why aren't we not building something to go up there, you know, pick up on aisle seven sort of deal? Right. Uh, people have been working on it. Um, a couple of the things that I was working on for NASA and then for DARPA was trying to be able to go to uh, a satellite and repair it or potentially scavenge useful parts off of it because it's really expensive to get things up into space. Um, but I think, uh, unfortunately, it's continued to be cheap enough just to build a new satellite and launch it than to go through all of the trouble of um, cleaning up after yourself. Uh, these days, you're supposed to have a plan for what you're going to do for the satellite's end of life, that you're going to like move it out of the way or, or have, have a plan for what to do um, at the end so that it's, it's not just junk cluttering up, especially some of the more useful areas of space, like geostationary orbit, where you're parked directly over one place on Earth. You know, that's a specific orbit out there. And if you leave stuff in there, then it's all junked up. Right. I guess in one way, it's a defense mechanism for anyone trying to get here. But it also <laughs> makes it real hard to get off the planet if it's full up of stuff, because even the tiniest little piece of junk... And a propel and being when you're being propelled at that rate, you put a nice hole in your hull or whatever. Yeah, the the thing that always blows my mind a little bit is that when you're in space and orbit around Earth, you're still at something like ninety percent of the gravity that you would be if you were standing on Earth. You're just moving sideways very, very fast. So it's like the old uh, 
Douglas Adams line of like, you're throwing yourself at the ground and missing. Like that's essentially what orbiting is. So everything up there is moving very, very fast. And, you know, people have been worried about this since the the seventies, at least there was, um, I think a NASA scientist named Kessler who's went through the calculations and was like, you could have a collision that made a bunch of junk that made more junk and more collisions and more junk. And eventually you just have all these little bits of parts whizzing around and making it, uh, all but impossible to be in space. It's like walking over a Lego pile. <laughs> oh, no. Yes. <laughs> you know, I met, I had a woman on the show that is a firewalker, and I asked her, I said, have you ever had a Lego walk? Because I think that would be harder than fire. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds uh, very painful. It really does. Steps on many Legos. Oh, me too. It's the worst. Um, your work in, your when you were getting your doctorate, is was in superfluidity? Is that correct? <sighs> Or is that was the uh, end game? That was the end game. Okay. Um, so explain if, what that is to people because I think that absolutely. many do not know. Absolutely. <clears throat> so it turns out that for some materials, um, if you get them cold enough, then all sorts of interesting quantum mechanical effects that normally happen on very small scales with small particles instead become. Uh, part of the larger system. So if you cool, for example, liquid helium down, if you get it cold enough, then it becomes a superfluid. What's actually happening is that it's all in, in essence, the same quantum state. And so it, it doesn't have friction, for example. If you've heard of superconductivity, that's a case where it's, it's sort of the passing electrons around a version of not having any friction. You don't have any resistance, so the electrons flow freely, and you don't lose your electricity to uh, resistive effects like them heating. The Bose-Einstein condensate that I mentioned before, um, particles come in, in sort of two flavors. You've got bosons and you've got fermions, uh, and we've got this physical quantity we call spin, which is just, I mean, you might as well call it fupil. Like, it's just a name that we have given to this, this physical quantity. And... Just like our our money in the U.S. is quantized in terms of a penny, like if you're going to get cash, you don't get like a half penny, you don't bite off a piece of it. It doesn't go any smaller than a penny. Um, this spin is quantized to have a unit of one half. So you can have one half, one, one and a half, two, two and a half, but you can't have like 2.7. So if you've got uh, a half or one and a half or two and a half spin or something like that, then it's a fermion. If you have one, two, three, four spin, then it's a boson. And that basically tells you how much they like each other. Like bosons, you can dump them all into the same quantum mechanical state and they're, they're fine. Whereas fermions, it's more like they're on a staircase. So you could put one in the bottom state and then the next one, one state up from that and then one, one state up from that. But what that means is that if you cool bosons down, they sort of all fall into that bottom level and become, um, in this case, what we call a Bose-Einstein condensate. And so you start to see some of these effects like superfluidity uh, and similar. Meaning and that they're all acting together. They're all acting together. Uh, you can make an atom laser out of them, for example. Like the difference between a laser and regular light is that the laser light is all coupled together, quantum mechanically speaking. Well, the same thing is happening with the atoms when you cool them all down uh, if they're bosons and they become this condensate. So you can actually kick off little bits of the cloud of atoms and they stay quantum mechanically coherent. They're linked by quantum mechanics. Um, so you've created sort of an atom laser. Which is used for? Uh, more science. More oh, science! <laughs> yes. Yeah, part of the fun of all of this is, like, there's no direct practical effect. It's it's just cool. It is just Both, cool. That's why uh, I love theoretical metaphorically physics. and literally. I always yes. say that on this show. Theoretical physics is that you have a problem, and you can maybe work 70 years on that problem. And it's, yeah. it's, it's, uh, it's Ithaca. It's the journey more than the destination. Yep. Yeah. 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 So, the, like, making Bose-Einstein condensates was a big deal because... Um, the, the physicists Bose and Einstein had worked through the math and said, this is something that should be possible. But no one had ever done it in gases and these like 
clouds of atoms before until 1995, which won several people the Nobel Prize. Um, so about the time I was going into graduate school, this had happened. And it turns out you can actually do the same thing with fermions, but what you have to do is get them to pair up. Because if I've got a, a particle with a spin of one half, and I've got another particle with a spin of one half, and I stick them together, now I've got a particle with a spin of one, or I guess a system with a spin of one, it's a boson. I can then make it all clump together into this condensate. So you're turning the Fermi into the boson. Yes, oh, I, I'm cool. turning the individual fermions yeah. into a pair that act like a boson. So We're cool. sort of saying, buddy up, and yeah. now pretend now you can be a boson. It's physics tinder. <laughs> yes. <laughs> now I'm just imagining like the atoms swiping in uh -huh. different directions, trying to decide if they're going to pair up or not. Um, so that was what I spent uh, my graduate career doing was um, working to get those fermions to pair up and then cool down and become like a boson. And so you would get what was called a fermionic superfluid. And how do you get them to acknowledge and pair? Um, so you have to manipulate the atom's state um, using magnets so a magnetic field what we would do is we would trap them in a laser like if you're going to cool uh, a cloud of atoms typically you cool them kind of like a cup of coffee cools so you'd have all these lasers that would trap them like marbles in a bowl and so they're all rattling around and then if you lower the sides of the bowl then the marbles that are moving the fastest will occasionally hit and pop out and the rest of the ones that are left aren't moving as fast. And in this case, motion and temperature are, are very tightly related. So you'd, just like in a cup of coffee, it's sitting there and the, the water molecules are bouncing around and then occasionally some of them will hit in such a way that they gain enough energy to turn into steam and rise, but everything else stays cooler. So that's evaporative cooling. You're letting some of the stuff evaporate out to leave behind cooler atoms. Does that mean a microwave works in the opposite direction? More or less, yeah. It's um, sending out these microwaves that make the water molecules kind of go boing, 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 and pick up energy because they're vibrating and heat. All this stuff is so exciting to me. All of it. I love learning about mm -hmm. it. I am the first to say I don't understand things all the time, and I just keep going until some little thing goes off in my brain. Or I say, okay, I guess... Mm -hmm. I can't understand that, and I'll go to the next thing. For example, when I uh, read the Walter Isaacson book on Einstein, uh, I had to keep calling my dad on the phone, said, could you please explain this to me? And then I would go back and listen, and then I would ask him more questions. It's a lot of work, but it's certainly, mm -hmm. to me, worthwhile. But I do think, and you've mentioned, you mentioned this on a, I think it was on a TED Talk that I watched, that there is a, a skepticism of science, I think is the, is the phrase you've used. Why? <laughs> Why do you think? This is a philosophical question, but I'm, I, for example, COVID is a great example. People learning about co the scientists learning about COVID in real time. I don't think hum the, the people that aren't scientists have ever witnessed how it works, how science works. Right. It's data collection, it's readjusting, it's data collection, it's readjusting. Science, we say this on the show all the time, science is not proving something right, it's proving something wrong, and, mm -hmm. and going from there. And it has created this cacophony of voices that are anti-science. And do you think it was always there? Or do you think that's something that's that in this day and age, because of things like internet fallacies being spread like wildfire and all that? That's a really good question. Uh, and I'd love to be able to solve it. Um, I think it's always been there. I think there, you're going to have distrust of people in power, people with knowledge. Like that's, I think, part of the human condition. And it doesn't help that... Um, you know, people have done bad stuff in quote unquote the name of science or people have used science in a way that's harmful um, <clears throat> I am the destroyer of worlds right uh, you know there's been a lot of unethical medical work 
that has been done and experiments uh, and the use of of people. Sure. Um, you know, you've got uh, Henrietta Lacks. Has, her oh. cells have enabled all of this medical breakthroughs taken without her consent and knowledge. Yes, um, and not only that, but billions of dollars have been made off of those cells. I, I have a Twitter campaign. Every couple weeks, I, I send tweets. I know that you can't get a posthumous Nobel, but if anyone deserves one in medicine, it's her. Yeah, yeah. So I, I can totally understand why um, people have concerns, people doubt um, and, and it's very unsettling in some ways to watch science done in real time. Mm. Like it's a little easier when it's, if I'm talking about all of that laser cooling and trapping, it doesn't have a direct impact on my life. And it doesn't have a direct impact on lots of people's lives. When you start talking about medical science, well, that's, mm. that's huge, right? Um, you've got a, a case where we have this pandemic, we have this disease, there's lots that we haven't known about it and we've had to learn as we go. Um, the, the medical researchers and the doctors and the, the frontline medical workers have made decisions based on their best understanding at the time and then we learn more like, oh wait, actually, that's no good. We need to change how we're approaching it. And you hear enough of that and you, you start to feel like, okay, I think maybe they're lying to me. So I, I think people are understandably trying to find certainty in the middle of all of this uncertainty. And when you keep hearing the story change, it's natural to think, well, they're lying to me or they don't really know anything. Um, we really want certainty and that there's just not a lot of certainty to be had right now. You know, <laughs> we're getting a crash course in statistics and in learning as you go. And um, that sounds really great in the abstract. It's really horrifying when it's your life on the line. Absolutely. So, you know, I, I think about the, um, the, the campaign against vaccines, for example, as a, a prime case of, of people trying to understand why their kids have autism. Um, and then someone says, I think it's this. And having a reason and having an external villain is narratively very satisfying. The answer of, well, we don't actually know is not that satisfying. I, the same thing can be true for, we talk about this a lot on the show too, is that a, a natural occurring pandemic, which has done this sort of thing since the dawn of time in various stages and forms, not unheard of and in fact it's just par for the course but to right. make it a villain in a lab somewhere diabolically releasing it onto humanity is like oh at least then it's then i'm not scared to go outside because chaos reigns outside right. but even chaos right. is ordered yeah well and it's not like we're doing things that are all that new. There was the news story going around a couple of months ago pointing out that in the uh, 1918 flu pandemic, people had no mask parties. Yeah, that's They're right. like, we're not going to, you know, we're not going to follow this ordinance. No one's going to tell me what to do. Right. Like, uh, yeah. We're, we're, we're doing nothing new. <laughs> yeah. And we never will probably, unfortunately. Um, you said one thing in that, uh, you said two things in that TED Talk that I watched that I want to bring up because they're so cool. You said that fingernails grow at the same rate as plate tectonics? Yes. What? Yes. Your I haven't Googled it like, yet, but I think that's a, so cool. Yeah, they're on the, the order of magnitude of the same. Uh, like, that's, again, kind of bonkers, considering how often I have to cut my nails. I'm like, oh, the plates are spreading apart at this kind of a speed. Huh. It makes what is large and hard to get a feel for much, like much more personal at that point. How does anyone come it's, up with that kind of math? There is, um, you know, some mathematician or geologist was trimming their nails one day, and they thought, "I wonder." <laughs> so, I, I've ended up um, being very interested in science communication and science outreach. Um, 
you know, one of my hobbies is helping organize the science track at DragonCon, this big science fiction convention in Atlanta every year. And, um, you know, they don't train scientists to communicate. They're better at it now. But when I went through, there was nothing on a, any kind of communication more than, well, you better write a paper to get your stuff published. Like that was the level of communication that we learned. So I've gotten to do a lot of, um, I guess, sort of a crash course in figuring out how to talk about and explain different aspects of science. And especially to non scientists, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, because I, I love science, I love the knowledge that we're accumulating through it. I love what it's able to do and I want to communicate that to folks and, and find other people who are like, yeah, that is absolutely cool. And so one of the things that you end up doing is trying to make a lot of comparisons. Um, so I'm guessing someone was trying to figure out how to talk about plate tectonics and the speed and so they started going through, well, what moves at this kind of speed? And they're like, well, snails are faster than that. Uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And eventually discover that fingernails, uh, the typical rate of growth is about equal. Like, I imagine that was a lot harder before these days where I can go to different websites and like, here's a list of a bunch of things that move at these speeds. Here are a bunch of heights. Here's a bunch of sizes so that you can compare things. Yeah, and uh, I've been traveling, so I didn't get to Google that. But when I heard it, I was like, oh, I can't wait to ask about that. <laughs> <laughs> That's so cool. That and the, the we're related to jellyfish. I mean, Technically, we're related to a banana, so a jellyfish isn't that surprising. And jellyfish right. are immortal, which is so cool. I love jellyfish. They are they are some of my favorite creatures. They're super cool. There's yes. um, a, a really neat uh, set of them at the Tennessee Aquarium um, in Chattanooga. My my youngest child, they, they have always loved animals, and so we ended up going to a lot of aquarium visits. So I have aquarium feelings now. I love aquariums. I have been to that aquarium, and it is stellar. Yeah. Yeah, it is excellent. So anyone that is happening, Chattanooga is just a cool city regardless. Great art scene. There's some breweries. Uh, yeah, it's good. What are you working on right now that you're excited about? Um... So I've, I've sort of had this weird set of research things that I've worked on. You know, I've, I've worked on optics for space. I've worked on robots for space. I've worked on these fingerprint things. Um, I've worked on stuff to, to track drones because people like to fly their quadcopters into airports. I'm like, please don't do that. We'd like to be able to see if one is coming. Um, and, and most of them have something to do with imaging or measurements or, or stuff like that but it's just been a collection of of different projects because i work in um the commercial world doing a lot of contract research and development for nasa for darpa for the army for places like that and, and so i've got like this grab bag of experiences and i'm like oh nothing i'm never going to get to use all of these well there's uh, NASA is doing a commercial lander. They're going to be putting a, a new lander on the moon, working with um, an external company. And as part of that, it's going to carry this whole suite of scientific instruments. Are they doing it with SpaceX or? Um, Dynetics is one of the, I can't remember if SpaceX is one of them. I know Dynetics, uh, which is a company here in Huntsville, is in the running for it. Um, so a, a bunch of different companies bid on, you know, what would a robotic lander look like? And they're moving forward with that. And it's part of its package is going to be this set of scientific instruments that different universities have been working on. And so I got contacted a while back by a friend of mine uh, who works at the NASA Center here in Huntsville at Marshall Space Flight Center. And she's like, I think you might be able to help us because we need external people to come in and review all of these instruments, look at the design, um, and and determine, is this actually going to work when they build it? Are there things that they should be considering? Are there changes that need to happen to the design? What we call a critical design review. And so I'm like, uh, maybe, you know, send over the set of instruments. And so it's like, one of the instruments is measuring the solar wind and how it flows around the earth and my undergraduate research was on the solar wind one of them is a set of these retro reflecting cubes like the ones i put on hubble 
Um, one of them is an infrared camera of a similar design to some stuff that I've worked on in space. So there's like, oh, all of my grab bag of experience can come to help make sure that these things are going to work. And that's just really cool. It is really cool. By the way, solar wind is such a trip to watch to watch that in the, well, I've seen it obviously in uh, models and then to see how mm-hmm. the earth deflects it. Mind blowing. It's so cool. Well, and that's what's this, uh, one of the instruments that will be on the commercial lander is uh, this X-ray telescope to measure the X-rays that get thrown off as the solar wind interacts with our magnetic field, the earth's magnetic field. Um Measuring it from the moon gives you a really good view of it. And they've got questions about how this mass of charged particles, the solar wind, interacts with the magnetic field. And there's current that flows back and forth um, from like around the Earth and the solar wind. And there's all of this magnetic coupling that happens. And there are theories and simulations, but we've not measured it. So this will be one of the first really precise measurements of how the solar wind couples into the Earth's magnetic field. Is there an end game for that of harnessing it for to power things on Earth? To it's har- just really cool. I know it's really <laughs> cool, but are there is there a way to harness that? It seems like there's so much energy that's just going yeah, by. I don't know. I don't know. That's there's that's your a Nobel Prize. Get on right. that. <laughs> One of the things I think about is the more we understand that kind of an interaction you know i'm wondering can we use that to make space travel safer as as we talk about oh we're going to send humans to mars one good solar flare could do a number on you yeah absolutely so can we learn something about how the solar wind interacts with the earth's magnetic field to come up with a better way to protect ourselves when we're in space would you go to mars if they made the offer i know you've got a family but yeah, probably not at this point. I'm like, I've got a family. Uh, I like the work that I do uh, here on Earth. Like, I would still like to go to space, but I would also like to come back. Yeah, so talk about that for a second, because I think that that is interesting, that it's it's really that way, not that way, that way. <laughs> right. yeah, you go, you don't come well, back. It, so talk about that a little bit. Um, it certainly would be easier technically to send people on a one-way trip i think that's pretty horrific uh but i know that there are people who would do it sure uh because then you don't have to carry enough fuel to get you there and to get you back um and and every doing a propulsion off of mars i don't know how they would do it really right um it's it's hard enough to get there it will be so much harder to come back because you do have to lift back off of mars you've got to carry the fuel to get back um and it's it's one of those cases where if as you look at rockets and you look at propulsion having to carry your fuel really costs you you know that like a typical rocket is what like four or five percent payload just because the rest of it has to be fuel and the tanks to hold it there's a reason why when you're going to space you keep lopping bits of your spacecraft off and letting them fall yeah, it, every pound of weight you save is is tremendous. I can just imagine the I, the thoughts going through. I know they're trained to not have these thoughts, but astronauts thinking, "Oh, cool! I'm strapped to the, in this metal thing on top of these giant <laughs> rockets of fuel." <laughs> Fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's a a really cool series of books by the science fiction author Mary Robinette Qual. It's the Calculating Stars and its sequels, and it's sort of an alternate timeline where. Uh, a big asteroid hits the Earth in the late 40s, early 50s. So you get all of these clouds of, of dirt and dust thrown up, and so you get a dip in temperatures, but then it's going to ramp back up because of the runaway greenhouse effect. So they've got to get to Mars using, like, 1950s and 1960s technology. And it is as scientifically plausible as she could make it, and it's wrestling with all of the um, the, the societal pressures of that time and this time, the, the sexism, the racism, all of the isms that are all tied up in trying to get to Mars. So it is both really interesting from a scientific perspective, and it's just a really 
great and thoughtful story. So I highly recommend those. Okay, great. And, you know, of course, they've already, haven't they made a big selection of people to go to Mars? I'm, I'm hoping that they keep those things in mind, like populating a planet, repopulating a planet, if they can figure out how to make it sustainable ahead of time. Right. Yeah, that uh, that they do have all those things represented, science and arts and people of various ethnic backgrounds and languages and, and this sort of thing. Right. Yeah. Yes, it's it's definitely in that story, um, it is in conversation with all of those questions. Yeah. And it's not just, we're going to send manly, burly men to go and be manly, burly men on Mars. It's like, we need a functioning society. And that does include arts. It does include philosophy. It includes ethics. It includes history. It includes all of these spheres of, of human um creativity yeah it's a nice segue about books because you're also an author i was that kid who was trying to write uh like science fiction and fantasy stories and i would mail them into magazines and get polite rejection letters back um but then i discovered interactive stories and interactive narratives um like there were early versions of that with uh the, the old text adventures, you know, the choose, Zork and Colossal Cave own, and things. The Choose Your Own Adventures. And then choice-based ones, yes. Like, <laughs> yes, Choose Co's TM. Um, and so I, I found out I really enjoyed writing those. And it started out, uh, I was writing text adventures, so it was mostly puzzles that, you know, you were trying to, to solve and less of a story. And then as I went, I, I slowly ended up doing more and more story and fewer puzzles. Um, and, and so these days, you know, I'm writing different uh, sort of, I guess I could say sort of, I am writing text-based stories for, for computers and have now sort of circled back around and am trying my hand at writing just straight up fiction. Okay, so when you say for computers, you mean like Myst games or something, where you... Yes, yep. Yeah. Uh, mine are all text-based because it's much more easy for me to write words than to, like, make art. Sure, <laughs> I get that. But, it, but those ideas where, you know, you go and pick up the rock and there's the potion and then the potion's used later on in the story, that kind of thing. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, these days it's more towards those old Choose Your Own Adventure books... Um, but with a more coherent yes but with a more coherent plot and actual characters that's really cool i love that do who are some of your favorite it's the worst question in the world who are some of your favorite science fiction authors um i really like Nora jimmins's work uh the the Broken Earth trilogy, uh, which won the those all three books won the Hugo each year. Like that's how good they are. They wow. are so good. Yeah. Um, uh, trying to think who else. I, I Mary Robinette Qual. Uh, I really like both her uh, science fiction, like the the recent Calculating Stars that I mentioned, um, and she's also done fantasy based in sort of the Regency era in England. That's um, that's a whole lot of fun. Um, do you like Vonda McIntyre? I do, yes. She is a family friend. She is good friends with really? my mom. Yeah, she passed away. I think now it's been two years at this point. But Yeah. Yeah, yeah I got introduced to her, uh, was it Spock's World? One of the Star Trek tie-in novels that she sure. wrote was yeah. the first one of hers I read. I was like, oh, I, I like her writing. Yeah, she wrote Wrath of Khan. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> yeah. That's amazing to think about. I know. We had the uh, the original uh, screenplay at the house forever, and my mom just donated it to a local library uh, in Seattle. But Aww. I was like, no, I wanted that. <laughs> but that's okay. Just wanted to hold on to it, right? And just Yeah. Projects coming out. Any writing stuff coming out? I know you've got uh, YouTube stuff, the Let's Play Interactive. And yes. then the Ever Wonder Why, which I watched the one on um, burning things. That was fun. Yes. I loved how you were trying to you were, you were spoofing on the pronouncing um, what was it the word that is the thing that makes things burn which I can't remember. Flagistan. That's it. Which sounds like a place somewhere in the original USSR. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, um, I've been involved with a group that does online science demos at a convention called Geek Girl Con in Seattle, and so to raise money for that. Um, for a number of years, we did various uh, 
what we've called accidentally. Like we're just going to do something that's kind of goofy and fun. So I did some fake, um, it, you know, fake educational videos like about Vlajistan and the, the luminiferous ether. Uh, and then one year I did a whole video that was the movie Prometheus only with sock puppets. Oh, that is cool. It's, it is so goofy and fun. Uh, that's, that's what my acting degree gets me is like, I can make silly videos. Um, and science is so much fun. Yeah. Yeah. Have you been to well, the, the science museum in Decatur, Alabama? I have, yes. That's great. Yeah, I, like, I moved here and I had no idea that was there. And then I found out about it, like, I need to go. Yeah, that's a really good museum. They've put a lot yeah. into it. Yeah, it's it's really cool. Yeah. How can people find you? Besides, I'm going to put links on HeyHumanPodcast.com with your YouTube stuff and things I find that way. But what's a great, across-the-board, easy way to find you? The easiest ways, uh, probably the easiest way is to go to Twitter. Uh, I am Sargent, S-A-R-G-E-N-T, sort of like John Singer. Uh, that's one of those handles that I chose when I first got online uh, because it incorporates like part of my initials, which are SRG, and then I'm stuck with it forever, which, I mean, it's better than some people I know, like uh, one author, Nick Mamatas, uh, sorry, Nick Mamatas, who his... <laughs> His Twitter handle is Nihilistic Kid because that's what he picked as like an emo 16 year old and has it forever. That's right. So, um, my account sergeant, it's got links to my website, which is stephen.grenades with an S because someone else took grenade already. stephen.grenades.com. Okay. I think you should go get Napoleon Grenade as well. Because <laughs> that's I, amazing. I, I, I teased my son. I was like, you could have been Napoleon. Oh, man. But yes, there were multiple generations of people who were, in all seriousness, called Nappy Grenade. I'm just like, none of that. None of that. No. I don't need that. No. You don't want one of those detonating in your yard. (laughs) Absolutely not. Thank you, Stephen, so much. This has been really delightful. Thank you. I've had so much fun. I really appreciate you having me on. Bye, everybody. Thanks for listening. Rate and review Hey Human on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks. Bye.